This isn't an uplifting video about humanity rising to new heights. We're not going to share lofty thoughts about the cloud and how it enables us to do things we've never dreamed of. Want to be moved? Read a poem. Want a partner that protects your data and keeps your enterprise flying high? Let's talk. We're Securonix, and this flock of starlings, while evocative, is no match for those who want to bring your world crashing down. That's where we rise to the occasion, with unpoetic yet highly effective cybersecurity capabilities, like category pioneering behavior analytics, and big data architecture that's designed to handle massive volume, like big city timelines kind of volume. We deliver SIM like no other, with built-in UEBA and SOAR, so you can reduce noise, prioritize high fidelity alerts, and help maneuver threats with the speed and agility of this totally symbolic athlete. And you know what makes it even more empowering? Our scalable platform is built for the cloud, in the cloud. Not fluffy metaphorical clouds that look like puppies and bunnies. All at a predictable price that keeps your cybersecurity costs from climbing into the stratosphere. There. Are you inspired now? Feeling total peace of mind? Good. Let's end on a high note with shots of eagles, jets, and hang gliders. Hello, everyone. My name is Oleg Kolesnikov. I run Securonix Threat Labs research and development team, and uh, I also teach cybersecurity at Northeastern University. So in this third episode of the Threats from the Wild series, uh, we'll talk about one of the latest trends we're seeing in the wild, uh, namely those related to multi-factor authentication bypasses, specifically those leveraging pass the cookie or PTC, but even more uh, the increasing trend of using the pass the identity or PTI attacks. We'll then uh, we'll also talk about how you can better detect and hunt for these malicious attacks in your environments using logs. So. Before we get started, most of you have probably heard about this high profile dark side ransomware attacks that have been all over the news lately that caused a shutdown of the colonial fuel pipeline um, and resulted in, the, in an emergency declaration in uh, 17 US states. Uh, based on the currently available details that we have, chances are, the reason I'm mentioning this is not just because you know it's, it's all over the news and the significant, significance of this, but also the fact that based on the information that we have, there was a form of, uh, likely a form of MFA bypass used by uh, either the threat actor themselves or the initial access broker or IAB providing access to the uh, ransomware operator involved in these attacks. And uh, please keep that, that notion of IAB, initial access broker, in mind for a moment as we progress through the presentation. We're going to come back to it. And uh, uh, also, you know, the MFA bypasses, which are, you know, growing in, in, po in popularity among attackers. All right, so here's our agenda for today. So in order to be able to detect threats, we as defenders, as blue team uh, members, we need to be able to understand the attacks and what we're dealing with as much as we can. So this is what the focus is going to be. I'm going to try to share some of the latest insights about the uh, past the cookie uh, slash past the identity attacks that we're observing, some of the latest trends, some of the key observations we're seeing in the wild. Uh, you will see a demo of the uh, PTC attacks in action. And then we'll talk, I'm going to talk about detection, some of the insights to help you with your hunting. Uh, and then we're, we're going to wrap up with conclusions. Now, um, what, are, what are these um, uh, MFA bypass attacks and why are they so significant? Why are they relevant? Now, obviously, we talked about you know, them being used in some of the prevalent, prevalent attacks. But there's also this increase of uh, work from home that we've, we've all uh, experienced over the past year. Um, and it's here to stay. It's here to stay, uh, according to the details uh, uh, from the PwC survey, for example, 80% of organizations have been increasingly enable MFA uh, uh, to mitigate the expected um, permanent remote work or hybrid work from home arrangements that they expect to see as a normal and the new normal way of, of working for many organizations. And, and the important key, uh, one of the key takeaways is that attackers have been adapting to it. They have been uh, bypassing, increasingly bypassing MFA. Uh, they have been targeting more work from home users. And one of the uh, important parts to uh, their toolkits nowadays is the use of cookies. 
in addition to passwords. So here's a recent example from earlier this month. For example, um, um, malware group leaked millions of stolen cookies. This was an accident, of course, but uh, this leak indicates that um, threat actors have been increasingly leveraging them uh, in practice, and uh, they've been collecting the information from victims. And it's not just the passwords anymore. It's also identities, digital identities, that are then passed, and uh, as well as cookies. Uh, there are other things that are being passed, uh, or but they're being collected by attackers. But it's all in the malware nowadays. We have info stealers. We have, you know, Raccoon, Redline, Jupiter, some of the common ones, in the Vidar, Panda Stealer. And um, these info stealers are, are uh, uh, malicious implants that are targeted at uh, collecting user information and, and, and stealing uh, sensitive details from users. And, you know, what you typically get as a result uh, would be, you know, things like this, you know, for each user, you know, it would get the type of system that they're, um, they are using, you know, the type of cookies they might have in their system uh, for different, different services could be your corporate network could be, you know, some cloud services. Okay. So uh, moving on, what are some of the key types of MFA bypasses we've been observing from our experience in the wild these days? So number one uh, is uh, the stealing of cookies from the user's browsers through uh, either a, a direct exploit, a client side, or um, a malicious implant, a phishing attack, uh, followed by past the cookie or PTC or, or, and or past the identity. And there can be tools for this, uh, leverage for this. There are, there's a number of tools, Cred Sniper, Evil Jinx uh, 2, and others uh, on the cookie phishing side. There are ways, there are tools to dump browser databases containing cookies, uh, as well as techniques that we're going to talk, one of them we're going to talk about, which is the debug mode in Chromium-based browsers, um, uh, how, uh, uh, allowing, uh, allowing malicious threat actors to dump um, to dump uh, cookies from the user browser. So that's, not, that's number one. Number two, most prevalent technique that we've been observing from our experience is the MFA disable or some form of a MFA reset that allows malicious threat actors to, um, to add a new MFA device. So in the first case, first example, they don't have to deal with MFA at all. They just steal the cookie. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. The second example, they do have to deal with MFA, but they add their own device or they disable MFA. So it's really important for, for us as the defenders to be able to have the telemetry to uh, identify these attempts early on. And again, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, we're gonna talk about that uh, in just a moment. And also be able to connect the dots and correlate the activity pre, both, both pre, uh, pre past the cookie, past the cookie and post past the cookie activities. Uh, to be able to detect these attacks effectively. And then there's there's also a number of other approaches. We're not gonna cover them in detail in this presentation. It's just gonna be, uh, we're just gonna give you a taste of what we're seeing in the wild and some of the some of the prevalent techniques, but uh, you know we might delve deeper into those if there is interest uh, in some of the subsequent sessions. But the other ones that we're seeing as well, uh, one example would be SIM swapping is the classic one, social engineering, uh, Twitter hack being one of the examples. MFA integration keys compromise uh, where, you know, um, attackers steal the master key to the kingdom uh, that allows to generate authentication cookies. And we saw that with the, with the high-profile SolarWinds attacks. Um, and then, of course, there is a number of other approaches, as mentioned. There is the legacy app fallback, which is a good one. I like that one. Uh, there is the, the partial or misconfigured MFA implementations where there's multiple concurrent MFA users allowed and attackers are replacing uh, tokens, etc. Denial of service, fail opening authentication servers. Uh, the one that I, all, that I also uh, have been observing, or we have been observing quite a bit, uh, it, it has to do with the software security issues and, and uh, the issues being exploited to bypass MFA. And this was likely one of the, um, one of the, one of the likely vectors uh, associated with the um, malicious threat actor that gained access to the uh, Colonial Pipeline uh, based on the information that we currently have. Now, when we talk about... Um, we talk about uh, MFA bypasses and past the cookies, it is important to understand some of the key concepts. And uh, as some of you probably know, there is uh, a MITRE technique ID for this. Uh, it's called T1550004. Um, and that is for, for uh, the past the cookie technique. It's, not, it's a well-known technique. It's not, it's not new, right? But how does it work? So typically what attackers do is they are after this database inside the user, the user machines. Once they pop a box, um, they are after this, this 
database file that a browser store uh, uses to store uh, password, uh, cookies, and other information. So they could dump the information through uh, directly through 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 the file. Uh, in other cases, they might need to uh, to to run the browser in a as is the case with the Chromium browsers, right? So, so uh, in this case, they just pass a special parameter and make the browser start, uh, and then they connect to the port and they dump the cookies, right? So, and 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 the dump can happen over, you know, the um, here. It can happen as a one-off, and they get all the cookies, or it can be. We've been seeing that as well. And that allows them to maintain that access to the users uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay, so um, dumping the cookies is the first step, or is it's a pre-PTC activity. Next step typically is passing the cookie. So for this, they need to re-import the cookies. It's very simple. They just inject that them into their browser. Being quite a bit these days as well is not just the classic reimporting of a cookies, but also more of a um, uh, uh, credit card fraud type of style uh, um, impersonation of the users. And what I call the PTI, where they try to impersonate or replicate or, or make, make themselves as similar to the user as possible uh, by, by changing their user agent, by using an optional geo proxy matching of the victim, and, and, and as well as matching the digital identity fingerprints stolen uh, earlier, including their hardware and software to make it harder for the defenders, for us as the defenders, to, d to distinguish between the, the impersonated user and the real user. Okay, so it's very important. And that, that, that's why it's so important to understand what PTI is, how it works, in addition to PTC, past the cookie and past the identity. Okay, and these are some of the examples that for, you know, for each web, web service uh, that they could, uh, uh, where, you know, the cookie names that they could leverage uh, to be able to impersonate a user. So now, now that we uh, we talked a little bit about the pasta cookie, and it's it's a not it's a, it, it is not a new concept. It's, it's a fairly well known concept, but the attackers are increasingly using this. Uh, let me share some some of the latest insights from what we're seeing in the wild in practice when it comes to uh, these types of attacks. So the first observation that uh, I'd like to share with you it has, has to do with the fact that attackers have been um, have been using not just passwords, which is the classic example where they you know use stolen passwords and try to impersonate the user, but they're also increasingly leveraging cookies. And why is this important? Because um, with with the all of the MFA, right? With the cookie, they already have the session, because you know as, as we discussed, the process is you know whenever you log into uh, into a, a cloud service or some 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 corporate service or VPN, right? You know, uh, a user authentic gets authenticated, and they get um, a session session ID. And once they have the session ID, they can just their browser can just send it automatically to the uh, to the target, so that they don't have to re-authenticate. So once the attackers steal this, right, they don't have to deal with all of the re, uh, all of the uh, re-auth steps, all of the MFA. They can just re-impersonate the user. So, um, and so um, they are leveraging this increasingly these days. So that's number one. Number two. Um, let me just share, share a story with you. So, so um, a big shift that we're seeing as well is the increase in the cross-contamination um, attacks. So one example, one, one story that I'd share with you is, 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 is um, a user, a work-from-home user, um, was an avid, uh, or is, is an avid, uh, who's an uh, avid uh, gamer, um, was compromised. And, and the, the, the way they, they were compromised by attackers, uh, uh, was was through a Trojan executable, and as um, what attackers did was was they created a fake uh, game cheat executable and put it up for sale online. So the victim purchased it using one of the uh, virtual currencies, uh, ran it on his work from laptop here, and uh, um, complained basically that it did not work to the attackers. Then the attacker said, "Okay, yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. We're gonna refund you the money." And they did, but the implant that, 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 that the user ran on their system already stole the cookies uh, because 
of the reuse of the laptop, the personal uh, laptop for gaming and, and, and the work laptop for, for, for work access. So they stole the, the cookies from the user. And they didn't have to do much. They just, they just had to you know, lure them into uh, running that executable, which is a classic example for, uh, that we're seeing still. Um, so now what, what happened afterwards was even more interesting. So, uh, and that, that is another trend that we see where attackers don't really go into the corporate network right away. What they tend to do nowadays is after they impersonate the user, they tend to try to move laterally using work, work from home to work from home. What, is it, what, what this means is after they compromised this user, what they did is wait, they went into the cloud, they accessed their mail, and they figured out what their colleagues were. And they sent emails to their colleagues with this QR code containing a link to a phishing site. But basically, in the, in the email, they said, hey, you know, I just saw your, your, your photo on Facebook, which looks strange. And they, they had this uh, encoded link there. So a lot of the users, I mean, you'd be surprised how many, how many click, but they click on it. They were presented with this fake um, authentication form where they entered their creds to authenticate and they viewed things, but uh, that's when attackers move laterally to the other systems of the work from home users. And they didn't have to, it, it all didn't go through our systems here uh, as uh, us being the defenders. Uh, it was not seen by the defenders. Right, so there were some logs involved, so something that we could have seen, but you know, a lot of the movement ha happened on the work from home side. It was pure work from home to work from uh, to uh, WFH to WFH movement. Okay, so that's another observation that we're seeing. And the third, third example, in addition to what we talked about, is the fact that there is a an increase in the um, in the activity by the attackers collecting these credentials, the IABs, the initial access brokers. So that later on, other attackers like ransomware operators that we've seen earlier, with uh, you know, with uh, uh, Colonial Pipeline, for example, being one example, they can leverage that. They can purchase those credentials from the uh, IAB, the, the specialized groups uh, of initial access brokers, and attack the users impersonating them. Right. So they could just use Bitcoin for that. Now, the reason I mentioned this is because uh, there was another attack uh, against uh, or. There was an issue with the database that uh, came pub became public earlier where malicious threat actors lost access or, or really exposed their database with the creds collecting details about the users. And this is the example of what was in the database. And you can see here that they collected over 58 megabytes of cookies, over 100,000 records here. So in the, this was collected in addition to the passwords and there were a number of other uh, fingerprints collected so that, you know, the attacks like PTC plus PCI can happen. Okay, so all of this loot, quote unquote, was leaked, and there were millions of these leaks, similar to what we've seen with passwords over the past, uh, in recent years. Okay, and this is what uh, was stored in the, in the databases. And you can see here, um, there is a... Um, um, there's the cookie. You can see the cookies here. You can see the, the, the service that this was for. And this was a stolen cookie file. So the key takeaway from our experience, from what I described for you guys, is that all of these examples are based on automated tools that are available to the attackers. Attackers can leverage. They don't have to do much. There's a ton of tools they can leverage or purchase um, uh, on the web for this on the dark web. And all of these tools, and one example you know, is, is on the screen, they can just click a button, they collect all this information and then impersonate the users. And they don't have to go through the MFA. So for those organizations who rely on, on the MFA, um, and uh, you know, it's important to uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt and, and review their configuration, make sure that they understand the, the stack vector and, and not take it uh, as, as a, you know, not, not rely on it uh, to create a full sense of security for their, on their detection front. And here's an example of some of the tools that are available to the attackers. You know, some of the classic ones they've been available uh, for years uh, uh, in, in the part of, part of dark web, particularly related to uh, credit card fraud, because you know, uh, being much more sensitive to uh, making sure that the the, the KYC, the, the profile of their their uh, customers matches what they learn, and they do the fingerprinting. And so attackers are, are adapting, and they're you know changing the you know the user agents. They're 
goes they go as far as 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 uh, you know modifying the the browser parameters, the hardware parameters to match the victim's data. And we haven't seen that much uh, on the corporate side, but now we're seeing a shift with the work from home. We're seeing more and more uh, malicious threat actors becoming stealthier. Or you know, as we mentioned on the earlier slide, uh, the the very very similitude uh, or appearance of being true is getting closer to um, to 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 the victim. Uh, in many cases, and there are tools for this. You can see all of these tools available to the attackers they've been using to impersonate users once they uh, once they steal or, or purchase the cookies and their digital fingerprints, they can use these these tools to to impersonate. Now, uh, let's just jump into a quick quick demo uh, so you guys can see what some of the uh, best cookie attacks might. Be. All right, so what you're looking at is um, uh, a malicious threat actors box. And they just popped the um, the victim's system. Uh, again, the uh, uh, you know back, uh, um, connect back from the from the victim system. You know, in this case, we're just using a trivial interpreter session. In most cases, it's something uh, much more targeted. But uh, for simplicity, you know, we just go, we're just going to use this one. So they access the box, um, and um, all they need to do is, you know, after uh, after they uh, control it, they can just load the malicious PowerShell. It's all in memory. Uh, and then um, uh, they can load the uh, uh, PowerShell script, uh, custom PowerShell script that dumps the cookies from the from the box. And there are different ways of doing that. There's there's a ton of tools available for this. But you can see the cookies being stolen here. You see the GitHub cookies, uh, the expiration dates, the domain names, all the details stolen from the browsers. Um, and if they take one of the cookies here, they can just take the cookie, say for GitHub account of the victim. And uh, they can go to the, to the browser, and you can see it's not authenticated. And all they need to do is, uh, in this case, they, they're going to inject them manually. But uh, you know, for simplicity, that should be fine. But um, there are automated tools to do this. And after they inject the cookie, if they reload, you can see that they're now authenticated as the victim. No need to go through MFA, nothing. Very simple. You can do it in your browser as well. So, uh, so going back to our. Um, to our presentation, one of the key takeaways from the demo is that, first of all, it's very simple. It's a very simple technique, very effective technique, and attackers are increasingly using this. That's number one. Number two, do not expect, um, it used to be that you know attackers didn't really care about user agents or IP addresses, or uh, you know even the, the, the OSs they were running impersonation from. Nowadays, it's, it's a bit more, uh, they're a bit more careful because uh, we as, the, as defenders also adapt. And so do not expect, when you, when, you, when you look for these threats, do not expect them to be uh, coming from an unusual IP address, an unusual country necessarily. In many cases, they might come, to, uh, might be geograph geographically close. They might have similar properties. They might, have, might, might be using the same user agent. Uh, they might be using the same OS, et cetera. Uh, and um, so, so with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about the, some of the key log sources that we find most useful when it comes to detecting these attacks in practice. So obviously, you definitely want to look at the user behavior following the uh, passing of the cookies. We find that you know cookie passing can be quite hard to detect because oftentimes it happens on the user machines, uh, especially for for work from home, work from home uh, deployments. And so. Uh, you know, having multiples, um, multiple detections connecting them together as part of uh, you know what I call the your 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 laser detection maze um, is really uh, can really give you the most value. And but in terms of the uh, the log sources, uh, they're on the screen. But um, I wanted to highlight that you know you wanna you wanna have the script block locking in your PowerShell, and it also depends on the types of uh, normal activity you have in your logs uh, for your for your business as usual. Because uh, sometimes, you know, if you don't have PowerShell norm normally, you know, that can allow you to hunt very effectively. But uh, what we find to be most useful is the MFA logs and the cloud VPN authentication logs. Uh, you definitely want to monitor those very closely uh, in your environment. And of course, you know, if you can get ROI DR uh, and, and, and the proxy logs, uh, you could sometimes catch uh, some of the dumping activity early on if you could. Uh, if you could do that, uh, that would obviously be, be Preferable. So, what would these attack? What what uh, might they look like in your logs? So, here's an example from the your endpoint logs, and you can see here, you can see uh, some of the parameters that are passed by the attacker. In this case, what the attackers is doing are doing, they're they're leveraging the the debug mode to dump the cookies from the Chromium browsers, which include Edge, uh, Chrome, and other browsers. Right? They're all based on Chromium, and so 
when attackers do this, what uh, when they pass the special parameter, uh, Chrome is going to listen to this port. And as mentioned, they can then connect to it. But in this case, they automate. And you can see this HTML file containing JavaScript, which is going to automate all the talking to the Chrome to dump the cookies. So all that is available to the attackers as part of the you know out of the box uh, malicious tools, uh, uh, both open source and, and, and those uh, that can be purchased on the dark web. So something to be aware of as you as you monitor your environment. You know, be uh, it's important to be um, uh, mindful of this. The other example here actually comes from the cloud. Right. So once they dump the cookies, you know, what would you see in the logs on the cloud side? You know, some. Uh, I've, I've heard I've heard some uh, some researchers mention that you know it could be fairly trivial to detect that you know uh, so we we shouldn't care about the dumping you know we could just look at what's going on in the cloud and that sometimes is the case but but you know we find more often than not that you know attackers are are quite stealthy uh, and um, uh, in this case you're looking you're looking at two um, two events for the same user and you can see at the top that is for Susie Smith. Right, but one of these events is the original user logging in. The other one is the malicious threat actor impersonating using past the cookie or running the past the cookie attack. Right, can you tell which one is which? So it is um, tempting to look at the location here and say, well, you know, it's a different country, UA. Most likely this one is, is the bad one. Obviously, they didn't do the, this one is not PTI enabled. There, is no, there was no PTI, there was just PTC, right? And this location was the Des Moines, Iowa, right? And um, but the, in actuality, the real user was the one outside of the country, and this was the imp impersonated user. And one thing to see here, I want to, to, to point out, is some fields have different values, but most of them are very similar. Like, you know, look, looking at uh, um, most of the fields, they're fairly, the values are the same. But for, for example, sign-in ID is different. You can see the sign-in ID here being Suzy, but here it's empty, right? The browser version and the OS are different. And as mentioned, uh, for PTI, that can be, you know, do not expect this to be the case for uh, when PTI is used. That's why it's so, uh, it can be, can be quite hard to detect. Now, here's another example I wanted to share with you, and that also relates to how we could detect some of these attacks as, as defenders. And that is looking at some of the artifacts associated with the, with the common tools used by the attackers. And uh, it can be, some, some detections can be very, very simple, but they can be very effective. So we find that this one sort of is, is sort of the mid-level. Sometimes you can look at certain file names created by a tool. And uh, if you have multiple file names for different browsers being created, that can be indicative of a malicious tool being used. So looking at these artifacts, file names being accessed, file names, uh, certain file names being created on, on your targets or on, on your, on your um, and your end systems could be uh, helpful for pre detections as well. Uh, but again, uh, uh, rules are, in our experience are not might, not might not might not give you the most value. Now let's talk about our laser detection maze, right? What uh, what do you want to focus on from our experience? What, what, would, what would provide the most value in context of the types of attacks that we talked about? So the first example here is a detection use case that detects the debugging port use. Uh, or running the Chrome uh, with the debug port, uh, debugging port option. Uh, unless you're, you're, you have a lot of devs who are doing Chrome development, that can be a good indicator in many cases. You definitely want to combine these together. But you know, having different uh, parts of your laser maze covered with different use cases, in our experience, can be best. And then mo most importantly, you know, monitoring your users and also connecting the dots, uh, connecting different use cases together. Can, can provide the most value in terms of detecting these, these types of attacks. The other example is the headless mode. So running Chrome uh, in headless mode uh, enables attackers to, to do it more correctly. There is no pop-up window, uh, but it can also be run by some tools. So you know, c combining these together in our, in our experience can work the, be uh, uh, the best. The other example is what we talked about, lo looking at some of the artifacts. Uh, we talked about certain files created by uh, by malicious tools, but there's also attempts to attack, to access uh, uh, certain elements in the system, like browser DB files. That can be something that uh, you guys might be able to use as part of your use cases. Uh, the other example has to do with um, MFA disable, right? So you might want to look for certain events related to your MFA disable or resets uh, in the cloud, for example. 
you can look for unusual values in, in, uh, uh, in fields for concurrent logins if those are allowed that are rare for a user. That, those can sometimes be uh, helpful. If there is no PTI involved, you could detect the land speed violations where a user logs in from multiple locations and, uh, at the same time. Uh, that is another possibility. Here are some additional examples that uh, we find help, that might, might help you for threat hunting. And these are uh, not complete, obviously, but uh, this should give you an idea. So one example is looking for uh, SQL, SQLite and Firefox profiles uh, on the command line. So these, these look at uh, your endpoint events. Uh, your PowerShell log 4104, the classic 4104, uh, looking for remote debugging ports and uh, get all cookies to um, as part of your threat hunting can be indicative of attempts to um, obtain the cookies, the, the pre-PTC. Then the creation of certain files can be a good indicator. Uh, looking for certain command line parameters can sometimes be helpful. And we also talked about the debugging, but we didn't talk about the fact that attackers need to connect uh, to Chrome. So Chrome uh, accepting incoming connections on ports that are unusual for Chrome can also be indicative of uh, uh, an attempt to dump cookies for PTC uh, based on Chromium browsers. And then lastly, there may be some parameters that you could hunt for, like DP API Chrome could be could sometimes be indicative because that's the part of Windows system that can, can, can be helpful to decrypt some of the cookies encrypted by the, by the browsers. So uh, lastly, yeah, just a quick example of what connecting the dots might look like. You know, you might, might, might want to look for uh, Chrome and Bound connection that's unusual followed by or connected with uh, a remote debugging option being used. And that can be indicative of potential access to Chrome cookies that are pre-PTC. Pre so just to wrap up, uh, we talked about some of the prevalent attacks that we observed in the wild uh, and how attackers are adapting nowadays, how, how it's not enough to uh, implement MFA. You want to you look at your MFA configurations closely, make sure that they make sense, that they are, um, uh, and also monitoring them, making sure that uh, you're able to detect attempts to uh, bypass your MFA uh, controls uh, by attackers, uh, as well as the uh, user monitoring, so that uh, if, the, if, if and when they do, uh, they do bypass your controls, that you're able to uh, identify the differences in behavior post, uh, post PTC, for example. The other observation that we talked about is the fact that there is more PTI something that was traditionally uh, used by attackers, more used by attackers who are, who are after the credential card uh, fraud. But nowadays, it's, much, it's, it's more, they're using much more of, of those techniques uh, for covertness uh, to, uh, when attacking corporations as well in, in the IAB, uh, Initial Access Broker activity. Uh, work from home to work from, work from home, um, a letter of movement is something that we've been seeing uh, quite a bit these days as well. And that can be harder that can make it harder for us as defenders to identify uh, attackers because they're not they're not really moving uh, into the corporate environment until much later when they uh, have uh, a lot of different vectors to uh, come in through. So the net net uh, takeaway is that PTC and PTI are are, are very important uh, attack vectors to be aware of. They're increasingly used by attackers, and it's really really uh, uh, critical for you guys to uh, factor this in uh, into your uh, uh, into your defenses and, and be aware of the techniques. Uh, as they evolve. So with that, uh, this was our episode number three. Yeah, I think uh, we have a few questions here. Uh, thank you guys, some, some uh, very good questions. So one of the questions we have here is, is there a tool that identifies when there is an MFA breach at the point of action? And that's a very good question. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, guys, is uh, that it is not just uh, the point where they pass the cookie. It's also important to look at your environment and try to detect, or at least you know, have use cases uh, that look at the activity associated with the pre-PTC. The stealing of the cookies, right? Then there, then there is of course the the PTC itself, and then the post PTC activity. In our experience, short answer. In our experience, we do not we're not aware of, of a single tool that could help you detect all of these uh, different types of behaviors. But you should be able to uh, leverage different tools. 
leverage different tools that um, uh, uh, for for uh, to, to be able to um, uh, to detect different different types of behaviors and then connect them together. Uh, say uh, in, in you know in, in your in your environment, if you're able to have, uh, you know correlate those together, that that could provide the, the the you know the the most reliable coverage in our experience. Um, so the other question we have here is from your experience. How likely is that some of the past the cookie attack vectors can be detected by some of the cloud providers out of the box? That's a great question. So um, one thing that you might, if, if, you, if you read about past the cookie attacks, maybe if you've um, you've observed them, right? One thing that you might have might have observed is uh, that you know there are a lot of online articles about about PTC techniques, and some of them actually uh, are fairly obsolete. In that you know you could take an article, you could try to um, you know, uh, replicate, reproduce the attack. And what, you, what you're going to find out is that many of the cloud providers have already adapted. And what, what that means is that it's not no longer enough to just, you know, in case of Google, for example, it's no longer enough to just take, you know, uh, one or two cookies and inject them into, into the attacker's browser, you know, and, and, you know, for them to get access. Typically, Google is a bit more sophisticated and some of the other cloud providers are also uh, doing much more than just, uh, you know, accepting the cookie. They are doing some profiling of the, uh, of the users, and so attackers often nowadays we're seeing attackers injecting the complete set of cookies stolen from the victim, and that way, you know, they make it harder for the, you know, for the cloud providers to adapt. But the net net is that um, for some providers, attackers need to work harder, and for some providers, they might need to uh, might need to do less uh, to to be able to execute these attacks effectively. But uh, all of the providers that we mentioned on, on the um, in the presentation, in our experience, we, we've seen uh, 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 you know, successful attacks uh, reported, and so no one is immune. Um, what kind of environment and business could be best targeted by this method? So um, this goes back to uh, what I just mentioned about the cloud providers. If uh, your business has a um, on-prem MFA implementation. What we're seeing with customers typically is, you know, it really dependent. Uh, it really depends on the type of configuration that you have, how you configure your MFA. We've seen uh, misconfig misconfigurations in the MFA that enable attackers to um, compromise the environments much more effectively. One example would be, you know, for for, for some uh, organizations, they allow multiple uh, concurrent logins, despite the fact uh, that MFA is enabled. Right, so that sort of assumes that a user could be in multiple places at the same time, uh, and they also, uh, anyway. So due 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 due, due to uh, misconfigurations, sometimes um, attackers are able to compromise certain environments um, in a way that is, uh, uh, anyway, that that, that uh, uh, it makes it much easier for them to compromise the environments. Um, what else? You mentioned MFA bypass using integration keys. Can you elaborate um, on the MFA bypasses using integration keys a little bit? Maybe give some real-world examples. Uh, so, uh, you know, just to take a step back, uh, as I mentioned, th this is not a comprehensive MFA bypass talk. I just you know we just scratched the surface; it was fairly high level. If you guys are interested, we can take a deeper dive. But you know, the MFA bypass technique mentioned using uh, the, the one that, that that's using integration keys was the uh, infamous uh, SolarWinds attack. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, one of the threat actors, and there, there were several, um, one of the threat actors reported, uh, used uh, or compromised the server that had the dual uh, OWA or Outlook Web Access integration uh, master key or secret key, what's called the integration key on it. So it, it, it's, it's interesting because what they did with it later was they used that master key to generate the cookie. They didn't have to steal the cookie per se, but they used that to persist in, in the environment. They used to, uh, that uh, to bypass uh, the MFA in a much more uh, subtle way, put it, uh, put it that way. So uh, it's another, another vector to keep in mind. So once they're, they, they get into your environment, uh, they can compromise your, your secret keys uh, for your uh, MFA integration and, and gain entry and, and persist in the environment. I mean, uh, the victim's uh, cookies uh, in all cases. So sounds like, uh, what else? Uh, how can we implement? Yep. All 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How can we implement MFA multi-factor authentication in a zero trust architecture? So I knew I would get that one. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, I, th I think I think uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, the answer would be out of scope for our presentation. But uh, I would like to highlight one thing um, from our experience, uh, and which is MFA, uh, the ability of, of your MFA solution to withstand attacks and for you to be able to detect attacks in, in a lot of cases depends on the implementation details and the solution that you're using. We're finding that some MFA solutions, I'm not gonna, uh, uh, we're, we're a vendor neutral, we're not gonna recommend any, any solution, but in our experience, some solutions uh, implemented additional measures that make it a bit harder for attackers to, to bypass. Again, no one is immune, but uh, nowadays we're seeing a fairly uneven playing field. And so uh, the number one, number two, it also depends on how you implemented your MFA and whether or not you, you, you follow, because those might change as a result of shadow IT, some things might get disabled. And so uh, in, in terms of zero trust, right, there's still the aspect related to, uh, related to stealing the, the keys from the, from, 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 from the individual uh, uh, points of access, right? Where, where, you know, in zero trust, obviously, you know, you, um, you, 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 uh, you have to, you don't trust your, your environment. Uh, there, there isn't a point where, you know, where, where you, you, you automatically assume that, you know, your, your, your user is trusted and you limit, uh, you know, the, the access uh, to, uh, to, to certain resources based on the need to know. So all of that can still be, um, it, it might make it a bit harder for the, for the attackers to, to, um, um, scale up their attacks, but it's still, still, uh, uh, in our experience, it still is possible in many cases for them to steal those master keys, the keys to the, to the kingdom and, um, bypass the, uh, authentication and the MFA mechanisms. So hopefully, uh, this was useful to you. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up our, wrap up our session. Thank you all for attending.